Welcome back to GEMS Podcast. I am the founder and host, Ms. Genesis Amarskem, and my special guest is Jamal Javanji. And here is a bit about Jamal. He is a best-selling author, podcaster, and life coach, a graduate of Liberty University, where he studied religion. He is now passionate about helping individuals, couples, and groups become empowered, whole, and liberated by helping to identify and clear systems of belief that create fear, disharmony, and disease, Jamal seeks to restore awareness of the ever-present and unitive divine flow of abundance, goodwill, and love that exists for us all, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And today, we're going to learn about where Jamal started to where he is now and talk about his book living for a living so without further ado please welcome jamal javanji to gems podcast genesis thank you so much for having me on your show it's just a delight to meet you and to be to be a part of this podcast Likewise, and thank you for coming on and just sharing and holding space with me, as well as, you know, sharing some of your vulnerabilities, because I know sometimes it's hard to talk about those start ugly moments or the truth. But before we peel the onion layers back, I definitely want you to share a fun and interesting fact about yourself, Jamal. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, I am, I don't, I don't know if this is interesting. I think it's fun. I am, I was born and raised in Ohio. I live in Southern California now, but I was born and raised in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. That makes me a huge Ohio state Buckeye fan. Um, so that's, that is a, a fact about me. <laughs> um, uh, something interesting. Well, I grew up, um, in a, in a family of very unlikely parents. Uh, my, my father was born and raised in the, in the, uh, in an island on the east coast of Africa um, called Zanzibar, which is now part of Tanzania. But at the time, it was a British colony. My dad's family is originally from India, but they migrated to Zanzibar in East Africa a couple generations back. My mom grew up on a farm in southeastern Ohio. <laughs> so completely different cultures. Um, and um, I grew up in that household with both cultural mixes. So Indian, African, and then Southeastern Ohio. Ah, cool. I like that mix. So I am South American, West Indian mix. So my dad was from Curaçao, so right off the tip of Venezuela. And my mom is from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, so the West Indies. So definitely I could get down with all that mix. And then if you throw in my in-laws who are Caucasian, Indian descent, Guyanese and Trinidadian, and then Cameroonian. It's all kind of like the United Nations. Plus, whenever you mix in my husband's side, who is Mexican, Black American, and whatever else, it's like the United Nations over here. Amazing. That's fantastic. So, um, Jamal, let's start by telling me a little bit more about your background and how you grew up and how that has carried over into your adulthood. What are some of the imprints and impacts from your childhood? Well, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, just going back on our, our origins, you know, I, f- I look back on it and I feel very fortunate that I was exposed to so many diverse points of view and cultures from my inception, because I think how you're in your formative years, obviously birth to what, six or seven years old, where, where we, we've come to understand that most of your, your, the lens through which you see the world through is, are developed by that time. So um, that, that obviously has its pros and it also has its issues as well. Um, but I remember really picking up on being that my dad comes from, um, so he, he grew up in Zanzibar, but then there was a revolution on the island. So his family had to escape. There was a lot of political instability. So they had to escape to Kenya. So they ended up settling in Kenya, Mombasa, Kenya. And he, just that exposure to a lot, just a, um, what we would call third world, but just lots of poverty, lots of struggle. So my dad coming to the United States, he came in his mid thirties. So um, he was, he was, you know, had already grown up and he carried a lot of that energy of uh, there was a lot of struggle for survival, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. And my mother growing up in Southeastern Ohio, she came from 
a lot of poverty, generational poverty as well. So kind of on both angles, my mother and my father's side, I just sensed a lot of struggle when it came to life, um, what it meant to, to survive. And I just watched them and they, they worked really hard. They were very consumed with providing, you know, money to, to live and pay the bills and put food on the table. And I, I remember watching that and just observing that and being captivated by that and thinking about what more is there than that? Like there has to be something more to life than that. And I was, I, I really was um, drawn by this, this fundamental question of, is this all we're here to do? <laughs> and there was a little story that kind of illustrates that I was in, I think, kindergarten or first grade. And there was a, a story, one of the teachers read a story to the class. And in the story, it was about an ant and a grasshopper. You, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's basically the ant is really diligent, hardworking. Um, this ant saves up food in the summer and uh, preparing for the winter. But the grasshopper is kind of the opposite. The grasshopper is all just all about partying, having a good time. So the, in the summer when food's, food's plentiful, the grasshopper's living it up and just eating and, you know, and just having a great time and not really thinking about the winter that's coming. So the ant was always thinking about the winter of scarcity and storing up food in the summer. And so when the winter came, it showed that the ant was um, living well and eating the food that the ant had stored in the summer, but the grasshopper was starving. And I remember when I, when I, when I was hearing that story, it really disturbed me as a, as a kindergarten first grader, because I knew what they were saying. And what the way I interpreted that story was the ant was my dad. And that's what I saw my, my dad doing, you know, just always, you know, worried about the future and working and storing up, you know, again, I'm sure those are, those are great principles, but the fear and anxiety that I saw in my dad, I interpreted as like, he's just like that big ant just constantly. So the winter comes, you have food, that's great. But then what do you do after that? You just do it all over again, over and over. And that really brought up a question for me of, is that really all we're here to do? It's just struggle to survive and store up food and, you know, pay the bills. And I remember asking that question at five and six years old, and that was a direct result of my upbringing. And that's what I was going to definitely ask you, Jamal. And thank you for sharing, you know, um, the story there, because it definitely gives a visual picture for those who are visualizers. And when you asked your dad that question, because obviously it did leave an impact on you just to see your dad kind of do the same old thing over and over. But you were probably asking, where's the flexibility? Where's the wiggle room? Where's the creativity? Like, I don't want to just live like this. I want to exist or enjoy the fruits of my labor. Did you ever feel like there was a period of strife or resentment based on how you saw your dad um, go about his day-to-day -day activities? And then, you know, then you see your mom, who's definitely from, you know, here from and has a different way of thinking. Did that ever create some turmoil? That's a great question. It sure did. It, it totally, actually, it was pretty immediate because I remember coming home from school that day after that, after I heard that story and I had a conversation with my mom because I wanted to know, because I, I, I was, my suspicion was that we're all just big ants, you know, and that's what we're supposed to be, you know? So um, I asked my mom, why does dad go to work every day? And of course she well, because we need money. And I said, well, what do you do with the money? What, what, what do you do once you have the money? Well, and she said, well, you pay the bills. And that's what, what pays for our home, pays for our food. And, but I kept asking the question. I didn't know how to phrase it, obviously, at six years old. I, but I was trying to ask the question, but then what? I kept saying, but then what? what? What do you do once you have the money? What do you do once you pay the bills? What comes next? And I don't think she understood what I was trying to ask. But I was really asking this fundamental question. I believe that all people are really deep down asking, like, what's the point? So what if you survive? Are we just here to struggle to survive? And she said, well, that's just what life is. And then you eventually die. She literally said that. And of course, you know, she's being honest, you know, but she didn't know that I was after a deeper question. But from that point on, my relationship with life became... Uh, poisoned in that sense, because I, my understanding of life was that it was pointless, that we're just here to survive, but 
what do you do if, if, if that's the only reason you're here? then it seems like a circular kind of the circular, you know, hamster wheel where you're just running in the wheel thinking you're getting somewhere, but in, re in reality, you're not getting anywhere in life and um, life. So I, I just, I sought for, after that, I sought ways to make myself safe, make myself feel comforted, but life seemed pointless. And that, that led to a lot of issues the older I got. So were you the only child, Jamal? Actually, I have a brother who's a year and a half older, and he never seemed to ask this. You know, he he was he seemed to actually uh, do quite well with life, and he didn't have the same questions, which I always thought was interesting. That is interesting. So, whenever you look and not, and this is not a com like to do comparison or tit for tat. I'm just really asking just mm -hmm. to paint the picture. So, whenever you think about where your brother is right now in life, and you think about where you are, and y'all grew up in the same household with the same mom and dad, what are the differences there and what are the commonalities? It's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, you know, with my brother, um, he seemed to, I think for a long time when it came to career choices, career path, um, I struggled in that area <clears throat> a lot because again, the question was, what am I, you know, what am I here to do? Like, what's my passion when, when you're just here to pay the bills, like when that's, a, if that's not something that bothers you again, that's a lot of people, that's just the way life is. And that's okay for them. That was never okay with me. So for my brother, because it was never okay or it, because it was okay just to kind of survive and pay the bills. And there's no knock on that. He's a great, great guy and, and, and provides for his family and does great things. Um, but it was never a struggle for him. And, and for a long time, I thought there was something wrong with me that I was the one that couldn't get my act together because I couldn't figure out what it is I wanted to do. Um, so that's kind of the, how, the, how our paths went in different directions. Uh, I spent years kind of wandering the wilderness, so to speak, uh, trying to figure out what I was doing here in the world. Um, but for my brother, he seemed to move, you know, directly into um, the profession that he's in and didn't seem to look back and it was fine. You know, I think uh, the commonality um, being that we're both, you know, come from the same family is that you know, we were really raised to be, to care for others, to, to serve, to leverage our life uh, in service for others. And I really see that in him. And that's obviously in my work that I do now is obviously all about service to other people. So uh, that's, uh, that's one aspect in which I would say we were very similar. Thank you for sharing that. And um, you're going to understand a little bit more why I ask certain questions in a bit. So um, the work that you're doing now, it's definitely around helping other people on servant leadership. Mm -hmm. You really connect it with religion and you're really focusing on mentally, physically, and spiritually. So the whole holistic aspect of a human being internally, as well as externally. So even though you went through that wilderness period, at what point did you have your opportunity? aha moment to realize this isn't just my passion, but it's my life's purpose. <laughs> well, I, that's a, it's a great question. And I would say it came in stages or layers. So it wasn't one moment, but a series of moments, but er, right after high school, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And we had some family connections, uh, in Ohio and I ended up getting a job, uh, as a corrections officer in a prison. So I, I spent uh, five years, the first five years out of high school almost working as a corrections officer in a, in a state penitentiary because I didn't know what else to do. And it was a good job. It paid good money. And, but I really, that was so instrumental for me because what I realized uh, what, an aha moment was, is that a lot of the guys that, that were in, in prison, um, you know, as soon as you, you know, you spend eight hours a day in prison, literally, uh, for money, which is a metaphor, uh, which is, you know, what I didn't want to do, uh, growing up was to leverage my life for survival, which is what I was doing. But the, the analogy of being in a prison was so apt, but I remember talking to these guys and hearing their stories and at the prison I worked at the average age of the, of of each person was between 18 and 24. So a lot of young people and you just, you get to know people, you start to hear their stories. And I realized, you know, everybody's alike. These people are just like me. And as a matter of fact, uh, I could have very easily been there. Um, some of the folks I knew I went to school with. So it was an eye opening. but then you start to hear the stories and you realize, and I started to realize at that point, 
that struggle, people's suffering is, you know, there's, there's a reason for it. It's, it, it's there's there, there, everybody has a story, but nobody at the, when you get to the core of what a person is about and what makes them tick, they are driven by the same thing that same things that drive all human beings. We all have the same intrinsic human desires and drivers. And I started to see that. And I realized that based upon their story, what, what they've experienced, that they felt that some core driver, whether they would, you know, maybe be whether they were aware of that or not, there was a core driver that was driving them in life that they did not feel they could access. And because of that, it led to tremendous pain and suffering that happened at the, at the perceptual level. So, and I saw this in prison when the perceptions would change and shift, their life would shift. The way they experienced life would shift, even in the prison prison stopped being prison for some of these folks when their perceptions shifted. And I knew that there's more to that, that this wasn't just for folks in prison. I started to see that everybody's suffering. doesn't matter whether you're in prison or not. Everybody's suffering or relationship that you have with life, whether it's resistive or in flow has to do with conscious and subconscious perceptions. And that's where that work began for me. Um, now it didn't end there. That was the beginnings. That was kind of a, a snapshot into that. Um, I could see it clearly out there, but the longer I went, the more I went now that led me, I, I thought my, um, my career path was going to lead me into ministry. I eventually went to a, a college and went, you know, became, you know, was a, you know, a religion major, ended up becoming a pastor. And that was great until it wasn't. And one of the reasons that, uh, there was a there was a few moments in that field because I thought my quote unquote salvation, if I use those words, was in helping people. But I didn't realize that you can't help others, you can't bypass you in the process. And what I didn't realize was that I was kind of a ticking time bomb. That there was lots of trauma, internal trauma that goes back generations. That that energy had. I inherited it and it was in me and I, and it was pain and I didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't even know it was there. So I try, I was trying to escape it through, um, through the addiction of helping other people. That sounds crazy. That say that was addiction, but it was an addiction for me. And I, that, uh, eventually came to a head and I had to deal with it. And that, that was the key aha moment when I really took my focus off of what I was doing for others and turned that focus on myself. And that became the, the catalyst for my freedom. Thank you for, for sharing that. And I like how you got to a point of reaching that aha moment. And you said, I need to stop looking outward, but I need to start looking inward. And once you started looking inward and working on who Jamal is and not what Jamal is or or putting yourself in a box or staying in this comfort zone, it's like you began to heal because you had to connect with the root causes. And it's almost like the weed analogy. So if you have a beautiful flower garden and you see the weeds, but if you just keep trimming the top of the weeds, the weeds are going to keep growing. But if you never go down to pluck the weed the weeds from the root, you're still going to have those weeds that are intertwined in your garden. And sometimes it's hard to face the traumas that we face, whether they're childhood and they're carrying over into adulthood. It's hard to face sometimes the ugly moments that we had in our life or even the failures because we see ourselves differently, but we're not looking at it from the aspect of taking the blinders off where we're actually having that 2020 vision versus having, oh, okay, I have that 2030 or I have that 2040. But really zero in on where you are and is it where you need to be? And is there anything that is holding you down mentally, physically, and emotionally that's causing you to not be able to walk into you know, your destiny or open those locked doors? Hundred percent. So um, I love I love that analogy of weeds and flowers. So it um it's it's um and what I realized and this is uh, an interesting. Th- I actually was talking with a friend recently, and he said, "You know what the definition between a weed and a flower is? Like, how would you do you know what the de-? and I said, "No, <laughs> what's the definition?" He said, "A weed is simply a flower that you that you don't want there." 
So uh, what I thought that was really interesting, but if you want it there, it's a flower. And I, th- I was thinking about that and the thing, the traumas in my life, I think the reason I spent years running from them is because I didn't want to acknowledge that they were there. And it seemed like I should be, you know, th- this makes me weak or makes me, you know, there's something wrong with me if I have these traumas. And I realized, no, no, I, honestly, our work, everyone, all of us come here and part of what none of us are born in a vacuum, you know, we're born into a story and, and, and the story we're born into is our parents' story and their parents' story. And so we're, we're, we're inheriting generations of quote unquote, a drama of some sort. And my role is to get conscious of it. That's what my work is. My first and foremost, before I do anything in the world, it's to get very conscious of what that, what that is in me and to begin to, um, to respond to it consciously. And when we do that, that's when we heal. And then you can pass that on. That's dealing with the roots, the weeds, so to speak. And you realize, no, the weeds weren't, they're actually flowers too, because I want them there. Not to, not so that they can torment me, but so I can address them. Because when I address them, I'm addressing generations and affecting future generations. And that goes into you, um talking about perception early on, whenever you change your perception, everything else around you changes because it's going from one mindset to another. So at what stage in your life did you decide that it was necessary to write living for a living now that you went through the healing process and you're now, you know, complete in a sense, of course, in life, we're going to keep on healing and growing because just like evolution, we as human beings evolved over time. We're not the same person that we were a year, five years or 10 years ago. At least I hope not. I hope we've learned and grow. Mm -hmm. Totally. And it's a, it's a great question. I, you know, I think the, the book, so I wrote a book called living for living that came out in 2019. And the reason I, I wanted to write that book, and I feel like I've been writing that book my whole life to be completely honest, but there, I became it began being convinced that, okay, this is a book I have to put out there um, because the number one, you know, again, standard question people would ask you, Hey, what do you do for a living? Right. And I know, I know what that means. Right. So most of us are asked, we, that's a very common question. Really. It should be rephrased. What do you do for money? That's what that question means, but what you do for money may not necessarily. Now, if you're fortunate enough, what you, what you do for money can be your passion. That's great. Then you're living. But if most people, and this is what I grew up in my family, watch, I witnessed this with my, with my parents, what they did for money had nothing to do with living. Actually, they despised it. My mother would tell me that she hated her job and she had a good job. She worked for the state. It was good benefits, good pay. It really provided her family. So I was very grateful for her, but she hated her job so much. She said that she would sometimes be nauseous in the morning before she'd go to work. And I remember as a child, I would watch that. I would watch her, her struggle with daily life. And I made a, I don't even know if it was conscious, but it was a, probably a subconscious decision at that point to say, I will never, my life is too valuable. I appreciate what she's doing. And that's all she knew. She did the best she could. But for me, I feel like that sacrifice allowed me so I could watch that and say, okay, for me, I'm going to take, I'm going to stand on their shoulders and I'm going to say, okay, because they sacrificed, my dad came to this country, uh, went through a lot of hardship. Same thing with my, my mother, with her, with her life. And I just thought, you know, you always want your parents always want your children to, to go beyond. That's what we want as parents. We want, we don't want our children to struggle with the same things we struggle with. And I knew that intrinsically. It, the way to honor them was to go beyond their struggle. And I knew that. And I thought, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to live for a living. I'm not going to live for survival. I'm going to live for a living. And I would travel. I became very passionate about traveling the world, going, seeing different cultures. And everywhere I would travel, doesn't matter where it was in the world, people would say to me, you know, they say, oh, it must be so nice for you, like to travel like this at such a young age, you know, uh, because usually you see people in their retirement that's traveling and, like, I, I wish I could do that. And, and every time I would hear that, and I used to think to myself, like, is there anything different about me? What's different about me that I get to travel and, and they don't, they have to wait for re- retirement so they can live. 
Um, and I just, I it became convinced that the relationship we all have with money is probably the most important relationship we will have because it will dictate your life because we're, 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 con- we're talked, we're, we're almost brainwashed into trading. We talk about time for money, but what is time? Is it, is it not our life? Five minutes ticks away. That's five minutes closer to the grave. Not to be morbid here, but that's that's the, that's why it's in. That's why my, uh, time is invaluable because it's we're talking about our life. So if somebody came to us and said, "Hey, I'll give you a million dollars. I will have to kill you, but I will deposit it in your account," we would <laughs> we would never agree to that because what will you do with the money? if you don't have a life, but yet we're taught to do that in incremental fashion every hour. And I just, I, I, I realized that there is a better way that we're actually here to live, not survive. That if we will focus on living, survival takes care of itself. Because again, I'm, people always say, well, it'd be nice to live for a living, but how does that pay the bills? Right. It's a great question, but I always say it's kind of like tires, right? If you want tires, you could go out and buy tires. Yes. Or you could get the car. You could buy a car. Tires come with the car. So I always say, if you want to, if you want to survive, that's great. But the way to do it is to live. Survival comes with it. But if you just seek for survive to survive, you may not live. And that's why I wrote the book. Cause I was convinced this is uh, people's lives are too important to leverage away uh, for survival because I watched my parents do that. And I, and uh, that was suffering. And uh, I, I, want to alleviate that for people. And that's why I wrote the book to be an entrance in a conversation. It's not, it's not the end all be all. It's not like you read the book and everything's great, but it's a beginning of a conversation into a deeper reality, if that makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And thank you for walking us through that. Because then if you go deeper beyond the surface, then they could really connect at the root and start asking themselves those very profound questions. So they don't take as much time trying to figure it out. And they could really start living life on their terms and not the terms of society or anyone else. And really breaking those, what some people say, generational curses, or I'll say generational lineage, and things that have just been passed down and down. So as we wind down, Jamal, I want to ask, what does the S behind you symbolize or mean? (laughs) That's a great question. So there's a there's a big S uh, in a picture frame on the wall in my office uh, behind me. Um, And that S stands for Santiago. Uh, Santiago, Spain, actually, and there's coordinates under under that S um, that you may not be able to see. But um, I, a few, few years back, I, I took this, I did this epic pilgrimage. Um, it's in Spain. It starts in it actually starts in southwest France in the Pyrenees Mountains, and it's a 500 mile hike walk that people do. They've been doing it for thousands of years. It's called the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, and it is um, it's kind of a People do it when they're in a tra- in a crossroads in life, or they're seeking clarity on something. So uh, it's kind of a long story, but uh, I had never heard of the Camino until I did, and the way I heard about it was seemed pretty miraculous to me. So I, I set an intention to go on this Camino and to do this hike. Well, um, you know, um, long story short, I ended up doing this hike, um, walked the Camino. It was an epic 500 mile pilgrimage. It took me about 38 days. But uh, when I, um, when I arrived to Santiago, um, I met what would become my wife there. So but we met on the path a couple times, just briefly, couple minute conversation, but then I saw her really where I saw her and we connected was in Santiago, Spain, and she lived crazy thing is she lives, she lived an hour from me in Southern California. But that's where we met. <laughs> wow, that is definitely fate. And Jamal, leave the listeners and viewers with your call to action for today's segment. Totally, totally. Well, I, I think what I like to encourage people to do is is this. You know, suffering. If you were in charge of your life, if you could, if you could dictate how you would experience life, I don't know anybody that would choose to struggle. I don't know anybody that would choose to be in a resistive, have a resistive relationship with life. Um, But the reason we do suffer, whether we're conscious of it or not, is because we have these 
layers of internal resistance within us and resistance leads to suffering. Um, now, a lot of times that resistance, when it comes out, it comes out in our relationships. So it could be re- struggles with, with our, with our relationship. It could be struggles in our, um, in our finances. It could be struggles with health. It could be struggles in a lot of areas. And um, I see people all the time trying to address those symptoms, but those are just symptoms, right? If you have relational issues, you think if I just fix the relationship, I could, I'll be, everything would be great. Or if I just got some more money, everything would be great. But those are just symptoms. The symptoms are there to show you something deeper. There's a deeper root issue. So I always say, if you get into alignment, internal alignment with the way life works, those symptoms will begin to take care of itself. Just like if you didn't drink enough water, you may have a headache. You could take an aspirin to alleviate the headache, or you could just drink water. The aspirin will wear off and you'll have to keep taking it. But if you, if you stay hydrated, then the symptoms go away. It's the same thing with life. So my call to action with people is I actually uh, encourage people to get into proper alignment with life at a perceptual or fundamental level. So uh, one of the ways that I help people do that is I have a a, book, a, a workshop. It's actually a six week workshop called the sustainable alignment workshop, which is really, we just spent six weeks reframing our fundamental relationship with life and getting into alignment in, in key perceptual areas in which we've unfortunately been conditioned to be out of alignment with. So uh, it's hard to go beyond that. There is a lot more beyond that, but that's the starting point. So uh, people can find out more uh, about that workshop on my website which is jamaljavanji.com. Amazing. So now we have your website. And for those who are interested in connecting with you on social media, where do you hang out primarily? Yeah, I have Instagram, uh, Instagram page, Jamal Javanji uh, on Instagram. And uh, I'm on Facebook as well. And I do put out videos as well. And all of that information too, is you can access through the website as well. And there you have it, listeners and viewers of Gems Podcast. Once again, I am your host, Miss Janice Samars Kemp. And my guest today was Jamal Javanji. All of his contact information will be in the show notes. So definitely start living life on your terms. Love the life you live and live the life you love. And remember, we only have one life. So don't waste countless time and efforts doing things that are not adding value to you or you're not adding value to it really be intentional and until we chat next time make sure you subscribe and share this segment we are on 40 plus platforms and follow us at youtube which is gems with genesis amars kemp for all things video content for those of you interested in continuing the mission of gems podcast which is to educate inspire and motivate while bridging the gap and connecting the dots between d e i and b diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. We're looking for brand sponsors and ambassadors. Find more information at genesisamarskemp.net. So peace, love, and lots of blessings. Have yourself an amazing day. We love you. We believe in you. And you are amazingly created for such a time as this.